Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well today. Um, I'm just carrying on where I left off like usual, okay? A month later, the chief's messenger came for the second lot of money and was sent away. Mr Carter, he was told, was waiting for some more gold to come from the bank in England on a special ship. The messenger went back into the forest and came back a month later. He was told that the ship with the gold on it had sunken in a storm. And so it went on. The Indians began be by being polite and ended up shaking their fists at the Carters. Those Europeans who knew what was happening went to the chief of police, who tried to force Carters to pay what he owed, but Carter always found an excuse not to do it. Not only that, but he broke his word to the Indians and pulled down not only the, built, the surrounding huts in the forest, but the longhouse itself, and on the site he built his bungalow. Mrs Carter had Taffarini, or House of Rest, put on her writing paper. She thought it sounded good, but no one in Manus ever called it that, nor would the Indian traders land on the Carter's landing stage, but always, like the captain who had brought Clovis, Clovis stopped higher up. And the many decent Europeans who knew what had happened tried to have as little to do with the Carters as possible. After this, not many Indians would come to work for the family. Those that did, Furo and Tappy and old Leela, stayed for personal reasons. Leela because she wanted to be near Finn and his father, Furo because he was her nephew, Conquita because she had a crippled brother to support him and Noose. When they worked in the house, they were unforgiving and sullen, and secretly they believed that one day the old medicine man's spirit, which had been disturbed and shamed, would rise up against the Carters and the family would get what they deserved. Clovis had been listening to Finn with a very worried face. But that's a sort of curse. Maya shouldn't live in a house that's been cursed. I know, but nobody has cursed Maya. Nobody in the world would do that. And Firo and the others had promised to look after her. They absolutely promised. And you're not going to tell Maya? No, definitely not. She's got enough to put up with. With those awful twins. Mrs Carter had, had last arranged Maya's piano lessons with Ness's father, Mr Helpman. Maya went to his house before the dancing class while the twins were shopping with, with their mother so she could enjoy it and not have to pretend that learning the piano was boring. If there was one thing the twins really hated, it was if Maya seemed to be enjoying herself. Mr Holtman came from Vienna and he was a first class musician. musician. He not only taught Maya the piano, he understood her need to learn the songs she heard everywhere, in the streets of Manus, on the river boats, in the huts of the workers. It is a rich land for music, Brazil. Everything flows into everything else. In one song you can hear the rhythm of the Africans, the poetry of the Portuguese and the sadness of the Indians. He promised to look at the song she had written down, and he suggested, too, that she had singing lessons and trained her voice, but this she wouldn't do. My mother was a singer. She was wonderful, and I don't want to try and copy her, she said. The other good thing which came out of her with the Holtmans was Nessa's friendship. The Austrian girl welcomed her wholeheartedly. She had a litter of kittens in a basket, a basset hound with soulful eyes, and a baby brother as fat as butter. Nessa walked with her with her afterwards to the dancing class, and if Maya forgot to put on a gloomy face when she saw the twins sitting with their legs stuck out in the locker room, waiting to have their shoes put on, she was in trouble. What are you smirking at? asked Beatrice now. I suppose you're waiting for Sergei to ask you to dance. The twins' plans for getting rid of Maya were not going well. They had been to her room and picked over her things, but Miss Minton had heard them, and since they themselves never went out of doors, it was difficult to spy on Maya properly. They noticed the notice of the reward for the capture of Tabner's son was still on the hoardings, but time was running out. Mr Lowe and Miss Trapwood were supposed to be leaving on the bishop in three days' time. Sergei did ask Maya to dance. Not only that, but he asked her to a party. It's on Friday night. It's for Olga's birthday. I know it's very short notice, but my father has to go to Belen the next day, and we wanted him to be there. Maya hesitated. Friday night was the night Clovis was to hide in the museum. For her to be in Manus then would be perfect if she was to portray Clovis to the twins, but only if the twins were there as well. I'd love to, she said, but I don't think I can come without Beatrice and Gwendolyn. I'm sort of their guest. You know how it is. Sergei so looked mullish. They're horrible. I hate them. But if you won't come without them, I'll ask Olga. 
Olga also disliked the twins, but she too said that if Maya couldn't come without them, she'd better bring them along. If Miss Minton comes too, it ought to be all right, said Sergei. She'll keep them in order and she, and she gets on well with our Mademoiselle Lil. And there's no trouble about getting you home. You're, my father will send you back in one of our boats. The Kaminskys were one of the richest families in Manus. Sergei's father, Count Kaminsky, owned huge plantations of rubber trees. He treated his work as well and the money flowed in. Not only from rubber but from hardwoods and coffee and sugar cane. Maya had passed their house, a big mansion with pink walls and blue shutters, and a garden full of flowering trees. There couldn't be anywhere better for a party. If the twins were pleased to be invited, they didn't show it. Only Mrs Carter's eyes gleamed. She hated the Russian family, but a count was a count, and who knew what might come out of it for her girls. Finn's dog was called Rob, but no one used his name much. He was somehow all, do all dogs rolled into one, with his trust and intelligence and faithfulness, and though he could hunt his own food and steady the canoe by put putting his weight in the right place, he understood that when humans were upset, one had to sit there while they pulled one's ears, or buried their faces in one's back, or even cried. A dog who will allow himself to be cried over is worth his weight in gold. He had been Bernard Taverner's dog, and now was Finn's, and other people did not interest him very much. But he was always very polite to Maya, and as she rubbed his back and said, I don't know how I'm going to get the twins to do what I want. He caught the worry in her voice and did not move away, though he had heard some interesting noises in the bushes behind the hut. It's quite easy, said Clovis, and Maya looked up surprised, for Clovis was not usually a boy who found things easy. It's just acting. Yes, but I can't act. Anyone can act, said Clovis. There's just a few tricks. Techniques, they're called, but they're really just tricks. They had just finished afternoon tea in the hut, which was one of Clovis's favourite meals. But when it was cleared up, he said, look, watch me. He went to the window of the hut and looked out, seeming to be interested in what he saw. Then he came back and sat down. After a while, he got up and did the same thing. The third time, Maya got up and followed him to the window. You see, said Clovis, if you go to the window twice, the third time people will always follow you. It's the same when you're pretending to give someone the slip but really you want them to come after you. Don't pause and look round f furtively. Just keep changing your pace. Sometimes dawdle, sometimes run. So while Finn checked the list of things that Clovis would need for his night in the museum, Clovis coached Maya in how to act a part of someone with a guilty secret. Because they mustn't think I want to betray Finn, she said. They know I wouldn't do that. They must think I've done it by mistake. Just because Fu just before Furo came to fetch Maya, Finn took her aside and took something out of the pocket of his trousers. Look, he said, and held out to her a beautiful silver pocket watch on a long chain. He clicked it open and showed her the initials BT engraved inside. Your father's? Yes, he gave it to me on my last birthday. It was the only thing he brought from Westwood. I feel I ought to give it to Clovis. It would make them absolutely certain he was me. But... Your father wanted you to have it. Yes, said Finn, looking stricken. But if it would help, he shook his head. Never mind, it's for me to decide. Then Furo's canoe came through the reeds and Maya hugged Clovis and said goodbye. If everything went according to plan, Clovis would be on the boat the day after tomorrow and it was hard leaving him. But I expect you'll come to see me in England, won't you? said Clovis. He had given her the address of his foster mother. I wish you were coming now, he said, and his eyes filled with tears. As Finn helped Maya into the boat, he leant forward and whispered in her ear. Don't worry about Clovis, he said. I'll see he's all right. I won't let him get too scared, I promise. And Maya nodded and got into the canoe and was paddled away. That settles it, said Mr Trapwood. We're going back to the pension, we're going to pack. We're going to be on the bishop first thing tomorrow, so Aubrey will have to send someone else out. Nothing is worth another day in this hellhole. Mr Lowe did not answer. He had caught a fever and was lying on the bottom of a large canoe owned by the brothers of the Sao Gabriel, Gabriel mission who had arranged for the crows to be taken back to Manus. His eyes were closed and he was wandering a little in his mind, mumbling about a boy with hair the colour of the belly of, of the golden toad which squatted on the lily leaves of the Marini River. 
there had of course been no golden haired boys there hadn't been any boys at all what there had been was a leaper colony run by the brothers of saint patrick a group of irish missionaries to whom the crows had been sent they're good men the brothers a man on the docks had told them as they set off on their last search for the taverner's son they'd taken all sorts of strays orphans boys with no homes if anyone knows where taverner's lad might be it'll be them they had spat cheerfully into the river because he was a crony of the chief of police and liked the idea of Mr Lur and Mr Trapwood spending time with the brothers, who were very holy men, indeed, and slept on the ground and ate porridge made from manioc roots and got up four times in the night to pray. The brothers' mission was on a swampy part of the river and a very unhealthy, but the brothers only thought about God and helping their fellow men. They welcomed Mr Trapwood and Mr Lowe and said they could look over the leaper colony to see if they could find anyone who might turn out to be the boy they were looking for. They're a jolly lot, the leapers, said Father Liam. People who've suffered don't have time to grumble, but the cows turning green thought there wouldn't be much point. Even if there was a boy, there was the right age, so Aubrey probably wouldn't think that a boy who was a leaper could manage westward. Later, a group of pilgrims arrived who had been walking on foot from the Andes and were on their way to a shrine on the Madeira River, and the brothers knelt and washed their feet. We know you'll be proud to share the sleeping hut with our friends here, they said to Mr Lowe and Mr Trapwood, and the crows spent the night on the floor with twelve snoring, grunting men and woke to find two large and hungry-looking vultures squatting in the doorway. By the time they returned to Manus, the crows were beaten men. They didn't care any longer about Taverner's son, or Sir Aubrey, or even the £100 bonus they had lost. All they cared about was getting onto the bishop and steaming away as fast as it could be done. Chapter 12 Stay, said Finn to his dog. Stay and guard the hut. The dog looked at him with despairing eyes and howled briefly. You heard me, said Finn. Stay. Another howl. Then the dog turned and threw himself down in front of the hut. Will he really stay? asked Clovis. Of course, I won't be long. Finn was going to settle Clovis into his hiding place in the museum and then slip back to the lagoon. It was, all red, it was already almost dark, but Finn knew the waterways which led to Manus like the back of his hand. He was going to take Clovis in the canoe by the same route as he had taken Maya. There was plenty of time. Sergei's party did not start for another couple of hours and it was not till the party was in full swing that Maya was going to start working on the twins. Finn had darkened his hair again. He wore his headband and a circlet of beads round his arms. Clovis was dressed in the cap and uniform of the cadets of St. Jovis's school in Manus. Finn's father had tried to send him there, but after the first week, Finn had come home and told Bernard that if he wanted Finn to go back, he would have to handcuff him and drag him there by the hair. If anyone caught a glimpse of them in the back streets of Manus as they made their way to the museum, they would think it was a boy from the college being taken back to school by his Indian servant. Right, I think we've got everything. The keys, a lamp, your satchel, the money so you can get to your foster mother. No, wait, there's something else. Finn felt his pocket. Here, I want you to have this. And he handed him Bernard Taverner's watch on its silver chain. Clovis stared, turned it over. I can't take this. It's your father's, isn't it? Yes, but if you're going to be me, you'd better have it, said Finn, and turned away quickly, for it was far harder than he expected, giving away the watch he had so off he had seen so often in his father's hands. They pushed the canoe off and Finn began to paddle out of the lagoon. The dog howled again, but he did not move, and then they were through the rushes and on their way. It was a silent journey. If they had to speak, they did it in whispers. Finn stopped where he had dropped Maya the first time they met and tied the canoe up to a tree. He would make his way back as soon as Clovis was safe in the hiding place. They waited for an hour till it was entirely dark. There was no moon and no street lighting in the small lanes along which Finn led Clovis. As they came to the back door of the museum, they heard the sound of dance music coming from the Kaminsky's ho house. The party had begun. This time, Maya did not feel like Cinderella. 
she was going to the party as well as the twins and as she dressed she almost forgot the job that faced her when she was reaching Sergei's house. Her dress was new, the last one the matron of the school in London had brought with her before she went away and it was very pretty. Okay guys, that's all I'm reading today. I hope you have enjoyed the story. Um, I'm really getting into it. I think it's pretty good. Um, but this is the last video of this week. So I hope you've enjoyed and I hope you can tune in next Tuesday. Okay, bye.